see for this. I'm actually not gonna speak very much just for a, a moment here at the beginning and then we'll turn to our panelists who are really the important people for all of this and, uh, and happily, happily so. So our program today is called 1833 Jacksonian America and the Age of the Common Man. And I wanna read, uh, read the write up that we have for this because I think it's very good for us to try and frame this discussion. And this was a write up given to us uh, by, by the National Association of Scholars. President Andrew Jackson's political ideology forms the underpinnings of what is now the modern Democratic Party. He was instrumental in expanding suffrage, political suffrage, limiting the monopoly power of federal banks and advocating for a laissez-faire economic policy from the federal government. The ideas that Jackson championed continue to reverberate today and shape many contemporary political questions. What role we could ask did Jackson play in shaping the future of party politics in America? To what extent was Jacksonian democracy in favor of the common man as, as we remember and as we often teach? And to what extent did it advocate for the expansion of federal authority? Now, our speakers are welcome to engage those questions or any questions that they so deem worthy uh, to engage. And I'll be very interested to see how they each present their, uh, their own ideas about Andrew Jackson. Let me offer the speaker biographies for each of the speakers. I'll do all of that now. And that way we'll get this out of the way and we'll have everybody just go in the order uh, that I have mentioned here. So we're gonna have Dr. Dan Feller first and then Dr. Jason Opal and then Dr. Harry Watson will finish us off. Each speaker will go between about 12 and 14 minutes. Dr. Dan Feller is Distinguished Professor in the Humanities Emeritus and Editor slash Director Emeritus of the Papers of Andrew Jackson at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Prior to Knoxville, he taught for 17 years at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. He has published numerous works, including The Jacksonian Promise, America, 1815 to 1840, as well as The Public Lands in Jacksonian Politics. Our speaker after Dr. Feller will be Dr. Jason Opal. Dr. Jason Opal is an associate professor in the Department of History of Classical Studies at McGill University. He received his PhD from Brandeis where he worked with such historians as Jane Kamensky and David Hackett Fisher. He has also published numerous works, including Avenging the People, Andrew Jackson, The Rule of Law and the American Nation. That's a great title by the way, from Oxford University Press. Beyond the Farm, National Ambitions in Rural New England, and an edited volume of Thomas Paine's Common Sense, along with other writings. And finally, we'll have Dr. Harry Watson. Dr. Harry Watson is the Atlanta Distinguished Professor of Southern Culture at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He directed the UNC Center for the Study of the American South from 1999 to 2012 and it edited its quarterly journal, Southern Cultures, from 1993 to 2019. He has served as president of the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic in 2010 through 2011 and the Historical Society of North Carolina. His published works include Building the American Republic, a Narrative History from the University of Chicago Press, Liberty and Power, the Politics of Jacksonian America, and Andrew Jackson versus Henry Clay, Democracy and Development in Antebellum America. So I'm going to hold my tongue for the next 45 minutes or so, and we'll turn it over to Dr. Feller. Hi. Uh, first, let me say I'm delighted to be here, and I want to thank the NAS uh, and Chris and Brad for wrangling this session. And I want to start with, with definitions. There is a familiar phrase, Jacksonian democracy, uh, that we often hear. Uh, it's often used by historians without precisely saying what they mean by it. Uh, and I want to start with the question, what was Jacksonian democracy? Uh, and I want to suggest that it actually denotes at least two distinctly different and yet interconnected things. Uh, first is a certain era or phase in American history, and second, more narrowly, a political movement led by Andrew Jackson within that era. So let me start with the era. Uh, observers at that time and ever since have identified the so-called Jacksonian era, roughly the 1820s through the 1840s, with 1833 about at its midpoint. 
uh, as the time when America really became democratic, uh, when the egalitarian impulses that have been building at least since the revolution finally broke out in full force. And that idea has been ar around for a long time, at least since the 1830s itself, when a Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, toured the United States during Andrew Jackson's administration uh, and then penned a classic work called Democracy in America, uh, which remains the most penetrating analysis of American society ever written. Uh, Tocqueville found uh, the United States to be, and these are his words, the image of democracy itself with its inclinations, its character, its prejudices, and its passions. The people rule in the American political world as God does in the universe. They are the cause and the aim of all things. Everything comes from them and everything is absorbed in them. That's Tocqueville and democracy in America. Well, to, to, to de Tocqueville, the United States, for better or worse, and in some ways for worse, uh, represented the de democratic egalitarian future. Europe represented the hierarchical aristocratic past. And other observers, both foreign and domestic, also declared democratic America to be something new under the sun. Some of them were exhilarated by that, some of them were horrified, but all agreed it was like nothing the world had ever seen before. And Andrew Jackson came to symbolize the era and to exemplify the possibilities or dangers of democracy itself. After all, he was a rough hewn, base born, poorly educated, self-made frontiersman who rose to become first a popular hero and then to be elected president of the United States. But when Tocqueville used the word democracy, he was talking about something far broader than Jackson and his followings and indeed far broader than politics. Tocqueville and the other observers saw democracy as the presiding spirit of the whole age, the kind of national zeitgeist. And they traced its working in every aspect of American life. Tocqueville saw an egalitarian democratic ethos at work in American zest for participation in public affairs, their volunteering in social causes, their enthusiasm for joining societies and associations and reform movements and moral crusades, uh, their lively institutions of local self-government, and also in the democratic leveling thrust of their art, their literature, their science, uh, their religion, their law and intellect, as well as in manners, customs, and pastimes. And de Tocqueville, this was all startlingly new. And indeed, with de Tocqueville, I would say, we can see this democratic egalitarian spirit cropping up nearly everywhere in Jackson's day. Uh, in politics, both Jackson and his political opponents mastered the techniques of galvanizing a mass electorate with razzle-dazzle campaigns and homespun plains folk candidates like old Hickory Andrew Jackson, old Tippecanoe William Henry Harrison, and a little bit later, Honest Abe Lincoln, the rail splitter. In religion, traveling evangelists carried a message of individual empowerment and responsibility. And they sparked a series of mass revivals and conversions that historians call the Second Great Awakening. Preachers measured not only the success of their preaching, but the very truth of their doctrines simply by the number of converts they gathered. If you couldn't gather converts, if people were voting against your preaching, then there must be something wrong with your doctrine, they believed. Uh, churchgoers, like voters, exercised a democratic freedom of choice, one of the most successful revivalists of the day, Charles Grandison Finney, explicitly compared his techniques of winning converts to those of a politician seeking votes. And just like new mass political parties, new religious denominations, uh, the Baptists and Methodists and later the Mormons, rose from literally nowhere to recruit millions of members. A reform crusades like temperance and abolitionism pitched their appeals toward every man and every woman staging participatory events and mounting massive recruitment of petition drives, self-help and mutual aid societies of all kinds flourished, aiming to uplift the mass uh, of American citizens. Uh, there were experiments in popular education, laying the groundwork for the first uh, uh, public school systems, and even poets and philosophers like Ralph Waldo Emerson and later Walt Whitman celebrated the democratic spirit and the worth of the ordinary individual. 
Now, with many of these egalitarian eruptions, Jackson and his party had little or nothing to do. And to some of them, in fact, they were overtly hostile. And yet Jackson and his partisans not only partook of the democratic spirit of this age, they tried to appropriate it to themselves. Jackson himself was elected president in 1828 on a wave of popular enthusiasm. He benefited from recent changes in the electoral system, including the expansion of the suffrage to include virtually all white males and the introduction in nearly every state of a popular vote for president. Now, I should say that Jackson was in no sense responsible for these changes. Uh, he didn't implement them. He didn't really have anything to do with them, uh, which they were made at state level uh, uh, and were largely complete by the time he was elected president. But he did capitalize upon them to cast himself as the candidate of the plain people against the aristocrats. Uh, and as president, Jackson molded his personal following, which was what it was at first, uh, into a disciplined political party. Today, we call it the Democratic Party, but its original name, formally adopted in 1835, was the American Democracy, capital D. And in the parlance of that day, if your side is the democracy, that, that is the literal embodiment to the people themselves, then your opponents must be the other guys, the people's enemies, the aristocracy. So this is the second narrower meaning of Jacksonian democracy. That is the political party headed by Andrew Jackson and the aims that it pursued. And so we can ask ourselves, were Jacksonian capital D party Democrats really, as they claimed they were, the exclusive carriers of small d democracy? Were the two meanings really the same? Was democracy a highly contested partisan agenda rather than a consensual spirit of the age. Now, the inclination of most historians today is to say no. Partly, this is because so much of the ethos, ethos of Jackson's Democratic Party, Jackson's Democratic Party, excuse me, strikes us as decidedly undemocratic. Jackson and his minions exalted the worth of the common white man, but they also though this was very much a difference of degree, there are many shadings and exceptions, but as a general rule, the Jacksonian Democrats more than their opponents denigrated everybody else, everybody who wasn't white, everybody who wasn't a man, blacks, Indians, women. Now Jackson and his party cast themselves as champions of the unprivileged ordinary working people. Jackson himself, called them the agricultural, the mechanical, and the laboring classes, the bone and sinew of the country. And they championed them against what Jackson himself called the moneyed interest of the rich and powerful. What he and his party meant by this, and whether their policies really served the interests of those they claimed to, are questions that historians disagree on to this day. So what were Jacksonian Democrats defining policies, the things that set them against their partisan opponents. There were a lot of them. American political parties then, just like now, were heterogeneous, highly variegated coalitions. But historians have singled out two major policy thrusts as especially exemplifying the Democratic Party ethos. One of these was Indian removal, and beyond that, the upholding of white privilege and slavery generally. Jackson himself, of course, being a large slaveholder. Uh, and from this point of view, uh, in, if you talk about the, uh, uh, the common white man, the operative word in that phrase is white and man. From this point of view, Jacksonian democracy, big D, was at its core really fundamentally about race. Well, the other candidate for primacy in the Jacksonian kind of policy cosmos was the party's attack on entrenched privilege and on wealth, or not on wealth per se, but rather on the oppressive sway that the rich and the powerful held over everybody else through their control of government and its instruments of chartered banks and corporations. Now, you can make a case for either one of these as the defining cause of Andrew Jackson's big D democracy. Uh, Indian removal was, without question, Jackson's first policy priority on entering the White House, and he began implementing, implementing it almost immediately, while the rest of his agenda took years to crystallize. On the other hand, 
Indian removal as a political issue receded sharply after 1832. And throughout Jackson's entire second term and beyond, that other policy is campaign against the federally chartered Bank of the United States, which broadened out into an attack on banks and corporations generally, completely dominated the political landscape. So partly it's, are we looking at Jackson's first term or at his second term? The other thing is that looking at constituencies muddies the picture further. If we try to look at who was, where was Jackson and his popular party? Uh, Jackson and the Democrats were popular in places where Indian removal definitely was not. Uh, New York, New Hampshire, especially Pennsylvania, where Jackson was wildly popular and Indian removal was less popular than anywhere else. And yet the, with the other one, the, uh, the bank war, Democrats also found that Jackson's economic policies were much less popular once Jackson himself left the scene. And what you put these two together and what both of them suggest is that Jackson held some kind of personal appeal to voters, which cannot be explained by the socioeconomic profile of those who supported him, nor directly by what he and his party claimed to speak, uh, to stand for. So there was something about Jackson himself, what that was, and on that subject, I'm gonna pass the baton. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Feller, that was excellent. Dr. Opel. Thanks very much. So I'd like to pick up right where Professor Feller left off and suggest um, kind of a variant of what he's saying which is, I wanna talk about the, the capital D version of Jacksonian democracy, that is the political movement led personally by Jackson himself. And I wanna suggest or argue that Indian removal was definitely his top priority, his top priority, and therefore perforce that of his party, at least until 1833. In other words, Jackson's priority upon taking office in 1829 uh, was to use every means at his disposal and preferably that was state level proxies in Tennessee, Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama to deport the roughly 70,000 Cherokees, Creek, Chickasaws, Choctaws, and Seminoles from those states and the surrounding territories. Now, as Professor Feller mentioned, this is hardly a secret and many historians have concluded therefore that Jacksonian democracy, capital or small d was therefore about white supremacy, which is there's like this flippage between because Indian removal, therefore white supremacy, which of course it was at some modern perspective. But I think in placing Indian removal into that modern frame of reference, we miss the particulars, which is exactly what we should not do in history. As far as I understand that our job as historians is to find out how things happened in the past rather than how they might feel in the present. And Besides, white supremacy itself can mean all kinds of things, including many contradictory policy choices. Why particularly Indian removal? So there, therefore, I'd like to spend my time by posing a more direct and hopefully more helpful question, which might seem obvious, but actually is not. Why did Andrew Jackson himself, in particular, more than others, want to deport all those people? So to start, there's no particular evidence that I'm aware that Andrew Jackson, born in 1767 in the back country of Carolinas, probably in the South Carolina side, grew up hating Indians, at least any more than any, any other North Irish settlers of the area did. The nearest Indians in his childhood were the Catawbas, who the government of South Carolina routinely or sometimes paid to track fugitive slaves. Slightly to the west of that were the Cherokees, who were simply referred to as the nation, Carolina settlers like Jackson's family definitely feared the nation, but there were no major violent incidents in his childhood. It's much more likely that young Andrew Jackson, was the, who was the son of a God-fearing Presbyterian, grew up hating the Church of England, even before Redcoats began to threaten his home in 1779 and 1780. In any case, his revolutionary traumas, if that's how we want to explain him, came at the hands of white Britons and loyalists. Uh, although during the war, white armies mobilized in the Carolinas and Virginia did launch several, several slash and burn attacks into the Cherokee nation, which would cause untold suffering and come back later to play a major role. So more on that in a moment. The young Jackson, I think who came out of the war as an orphan in 1783, actually reminds me of like a, a frontier version of Alexander Hamilton. Haughty, touchy, semi-educated, 
but also supportive of new forms of law and property that put him firmly in the Federalist conservative camp when it came to issues like debt relief in particular. In the early 1790s, Andrew Jackson rose by practicing law and representing creditors, not debtors, in the so-called Merrow District, which is centered in, in Nashville, uh, which was both a prosperous trading center and a kind of a vulnerable island of white settlement, about 150 miles from the nearest settlements of Eastern Tennessee uh, around Knoxville. But then it happened. And by that, I mean a breakaway group of Cherokees, so refugees from those revolutionary bouts of violence that Jackson was not personally involved in, began to attack the Merrow District. Now it's important to be specific here. I always tell my students, you have to be specific, exactly when, exactly who. Between 1789 and 92, which is when Jackson first gets there and makes his way in the world and, and it gets involved with a woman who is technically still married, the Cherokee, it appears to me, mostly harassed the white men they were most likely to see who were surveyors and hunters. They definitely stole horses and kind of warn people off, but to my knowledge, they did not actually attack any white households. They were trying to scare off the roughly 5,000 narrow settlers. But when the scare tactics did not work, they began to attack the Tennessee settlements. Um, and they did so officially. On 11 September 1792, just hours after a young Andrew Jackson became the judge advocate of the county militia around Nashville, this breakaway group of Cherokees officially declared war on the Tennessee settlements. And for the next two years, a horrifying and kind of off the record war ensued. Small bands of Cherokees, best estimate is about 80 to 100 men, uh, joined by some Creeks, attacked the settlements. And they killed at least 126 people in the Merrow districts alone, about one third of them women and children. To read the accounts, you would think that all the, the victims were women. It is hard, I think, to overstate the terror that ensued on all sides. Um, one settler simply called this, quote, the time of the forts, a reference to the tiny wooden structures where hundreds of terrified families would take shelter. Now, as judge advocate and militia leader in the Merritt District, Andrew Jackson was right in the middle of this extreme racial violence. For example, on August 29th, 1793, he was nearly killed in ambush uh, near Knoxville, not Nashville, about 180 miles from his wife, who was then home alone with the couple's four slaves. I'm all but certain that he took part in a, the decisive and in federal eyes illicit campaign that concluded this war one year later when a small 500 or so people white army burned to Cherokee village and killed everyone they found in those villages. Jackson's early, earliest writings convey, as you might guess, not just his fury at the attackers, but also at the Washington administration, which more or less left the Southern settlers to their own devices while using the small but well-trained US Army north of the Ohio River. As of 1796, young Andrew Jackson, 30 years old, was on record that all Cherokees and Creeks should be driven west of the Mississippi. And as one of the first US congressmen from Tennessee later that decade, he raged at the Adams administration for allowing federal policies to protect Indian lands and he even rejected a kind of uh, um, a perfunctory note of thanks to the venerated George Washington. So again, let's be specific. It's not accurate to say that Andrew Jackson was at any time in his life, definitely not then, anti-government. It is accurate to say that he felt enraged and betrayed at federal policies that enabled Indians to remain in their native countries. Now, as peace resumed in Tennessee with, under President Thomas Jefferson, Jackson kind of floundered. He started a cotton exporting business when cotton prices were actually declining. He ran a few stores by importing from Pennsylvania with limited success. He killed one young lawyer in a duel, and he had a brief bromance with Aaron Burr, who was fresh off his own Pyrrhic victory over current Broadway star Alexander Hamilton. He was, I think, a fairly standard Jeffersonian, although true to his Federalist and quite conservative roots, he always opposed local and state level efforts to protect debtors. I think that's really important. I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Speller or Wads Watson disagree. I think it's a big part of the story, but leaving that for now. What stands out you know, at a national level for Jackson was only really his extreme hostility to federally protected Indian lands. So for example, in late 1811, continuing his sort of th this, th this theme, he repeatedly wrote, like not just an accident, he repeatedly wrote explicitly about his 
sincere desire to incinerate the federal agent to the Choctaw Nation, which was blocking the fastest land routes to the cotton markets, and in his mind was also a terrifying danger, which reminded him of the 1790s. Yet I see no evidence that large numbers of people, even in Tennessee, shared this view, at least to the same extent that he did. So how did this person who was a kind of standard Jeffersonian with Federalist roots, but he hated Federalists because of the illicit war, how did such a person emerge as an electrifying political force? The short answer, the short answer is of course, the War of 1812, which is the worst named war in our history. It just suggests that it's like a sequential thing that happened, whereas it was actually a kind of existential crisis for much of the United States. In the Southern United States especially, this war was largely a war between white American households and a range of British allied Indian nations, sometimes with the support of fugitive and rebellious black slaves. It was like the time of the forts, but on a massive scale, on a national scale. And it made Americans feel, a wide range of uh, Americans feel like savage foes might break down their doors and kill them in the middle of the night. And I want to just suggest that they weren't necessarily crazy to think that. The key to understanding that fear is to understand that the frontier was not a clearly demarcated line between West and East. It's rather a general term, we should use it as a general term for any unsecured border of which there were many in the early Republic. For example, one group of New York Jeffersonians, the beginning of the war called New York state, quote, emphatically a frontier state because British, the, the British Canadian enemy across the Great Lakes, they thought, could easily invade or worse, incite Shawnees or Mohawks or Miamis to attack their towns and villages. The situation was far more precarious in the South. In Georgia and Tennessee in 1811, for example, by my count, one third of all the counties in those two states shared a border, west, east, north, south, with either Indian country or unorganized territory. And of course, every slave holding household was rather like a frontier cabin, a precarious beachhead in the perpetual war between enslaver and enslaved. On August 30th, 1813, an army of Creek and black fighters attacked Fort Mims on this extreme Southern part of Mississippi territory. They killed almost everyone inside, soldiers and refugees alike, and then disappeared into all those unreadable geographies, leading white Americans from Virginia to Missouri fearing for their scalps. After a bloated body washed up in St. Louis in May, 1814, the local paper screamed the following headline. Quote, the blood of our citizens cry aloud for vengeance. Let the North as well as the South be Jacksonized. This was a reference to General Andrew Jackson, who had just come to their attention as the man who had wiped out a Creek stronghold on the horseshoe bend in the Tallapoosa River, about 600 miles to the South. This was how Jackson came to the attention of most Americans, even before the Battle of New Orleans. Not like a Washington-like general and certainly not a democratic reformer, but rather as a Samson-like avenger who delivered them from their worst nightmares. Now, Jackson's victory at New Orleans, uh, of course, turned him, I would say, into a, into a religious phenomenon, not just a political one. Defending Jackson after he invaded Spanish Florida with the winking authorization of President Monroe in 1818, one congressman from Maine, what is now Maine, even took on the voice of a murdered Georgia woman, warning his colleagues, quote, that there is an avenging God, directly linking Jacksonian violence to God's vengeance. No wonder Jackson carried all before him when he re-entered national politics three years later in 1821, culminating in his near victory of 1824 and his final triumph of 1828. And no wonder that the first thing he did was to help through all various means get the Indian Removal Act through Congress, setting in motion a national deportation policy or project that in his mind liberated ordinary Americans white Americans, both from the terror of Indian attack, while also freeing them to plant and export cotton. So that's my argument. Jackson's devotion, personal devotion to Indian removal came out of his specific experiences around Nashville in the early 1790s, which the events of the War of 1812 brought home to large numbers of Americans, especially, but not exclusively in the South. Virtuous violence against savage foes was central, not peripheral, to the emotional and political formation of the young republic and Jackson's removal policy was its contested, contested culmination. Let me leave you with one final thought before turning things over to Professor Watson. 
I think broadly, we should see Jackson's second term, if not Jacksonian democracy more broadly, as surprisingly improvised. In other words, besides his feelings about federally protected Indian land, which as I've noted is, is quite vehement and clear from 1790s onward, Jackson's political beliefs were remarkably unremarkable to my mind, up to and throughout his first term. But once in power, of course, and once Indian removal was set in motion, and especially once he was reelected, even Andrew Jackson, the man who could turn, who, who, could, who had such an electric hold over American voters, even he had to adapt to the political world around him. So the party that he created in his image wasn't just in his image. The people who, did, who saw the age of the common man one way or the other or differently than Jackson demanded into his party and assumed that he would be their hero. As such, Andrew Jackson had to cope one way or the other with very pro-tariff Pennsylvania, even though I suspect his preferences were always more towards free trading South Carolina. He and his party had to cope with the Bank of the United States, whose bills were quite popular in many parts of the Republic and not just among aristocrats. Evangelical teetotalers in upstate New York, working class radicals in Philadelphia, hemp manufacturers in Kentucky, the Jacksonians, or rather the Democrats, had to deal with them all. Even as their base remained, the immensely powerful cotton planters and exporters who poured into all the lands vacated by Indian removal. Thanks very much. It's fascinating. Thank you so much, Dr. Opal. All right, last but certainly not least, Dr. Watson. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, uh, Brad, and to the National Association of Scholars for uh, creating this forum and, and uh, inviting me to join. Um, I would like to make a few quick points, and then I think we would do well to um, move on to um, to a question and answer uh, session or a, a general discussion. Um, first of all, uh, let's say that uh, we have introduced the subject of Jackson as if he were um, a very popular and influential president. Uh, it is important to recognize that this is not universally accepted. Um, some people, uh, some important historians of the period demand that we take the name Andrew Jackson off the era entirely. Um, uh, others, uh, you know, are complaining about Jackson for a uh, variety of reasons. In fact, I would say that these days Andrew Jackson is, is an easy person to, or an easy president to hate for a lot of people. Um, the movement to take him off the $20 bill being an example of that. Um, but um, it, more fundamentally or philosophically, uh, Jackson's policies and principles don't map very easily on the division between left and right that is so uh, powerful uh, in our consciousness uh, today as, as we think about the present and the past. Um, for people on the left, uh, Jackson's Indian policy is unpardonable, uh, and the word genocide is uh, uh, freely uh, brought out to um, to describe that policy. Um, Jackson's personal slaveholding, uh, he owned a very large plantation with a very large force of uh, enslaved workers, uh, is uh, likewise um, deeply troubling and infuriating. Uh, and his policies in support of uh, slavery, uh, and of course, as, as uh, both other speakers mentioned uh, in favor of Indian removal um, uh, are uh, equally um, uh, troubling. So uh, certainly uh, Jackson is uh, unpopular on the left today. On the right, um, it, although you don't hear this very often, certainly um, people who uh, probed his, um, his administration and his various policies would um, have to recognize that uh, Jackson did strengthen the federal government and the presidency and the power of the federal government to uh, uh, take action that would affect uh, everyday people's lives. Uh, not exactly a, uh, uh, not a, not a go get the government off our backs kind of presidency. Um, 
although this was not true across the board, it was selective in, in uh, different ways. Um, conservatives of Jackson's own day widely condemned him as tyrannical, uh, even though he saw himself as a champion of states' rights. Uh, and that was true also, uh, despite his, his record of confrontation with South Carolina. Um, he uh, condemned the secession uh, when the idea was voiced uh, during his administration. And uh, he also condemned the idea that a state could overturn a federal law. Um, but he condemned it in the case of South Carolina and let Georgia get away with it. So he was inconsistent uh, in that uh, respect. Um, entrepreneurs who were involved in the two big growth industries of uh, Jackson's day, uh, that is banking and transportation, uh, saw uh, Jackson as hostile to their interests and to a stable business climate general. So um, certainly uh, Jackson was unpopular uh, in those respects and that unpopularity could um, could crop up today if, if we tried to make a very exact application of his principles uh, across the board. Um, at the same time, as we see these um, different views of Jackson, I, I think it would be, we have to admit that he was a highly consequential president. Um, and the three questions that were raised by the association, the National Association of Scholars, uh, for us to discuss um, certainly were areas in which Jackson had an impact. Um, and so, I would like briefly to talk about um, those three, and then we can we can go forward. Um, the um, uh, first one uh, that uh, uh, Brad, I think, um, started us off with was the degree to which uh, Jackson was highly influential uh, in party politics, and uh, he certainly was. Uh, although I would say uh, most political historians seem to give his vice president, uh, Martin Van Buren, um, greater credit for party formation and party organization and uh, the theory of parties than Jackson himself. Um, essentially, Jackson saw the Democratic Party as um, a, an association of citizens to preserve white men's liberty. And the uh, so I've heard it compared to a, a, a trade union of the electorate where, where all the voters get together and protect themselves uh, under the wing of the Democratic Party. Um, the uh, he was very clear. And well, let me uh, read a quote from him, if I may. I have long believed that it was only by preserving the identity of the Democratic Republican Party as embodied and characterized by the principles of Mr. Jefferson that the original rights of the states and the people could be maintained as contemplated by the Constitution. And the Democratic Party was there uh, to make that happen. And he demanded strict fealty to the party as an institution uh, as a result of that. Um, his support for uh, party politics was so strong that his opponents were forced to organize their own party, the Whigs, uh, in self-defense, um, even though they didn't especially want to. Um, and the two parties, Whigs and Democrats and their organizations, were able to rally enough voters to pull political participation up to some of the highest levels the country has ever seen, certainly much higher than we see today. Uh, so uh, that, was, that was definitely part of the picture. Now, uh, the second question uh, that was raised was whether Jackson was truly in favor of the common man. Um, I would say eh, not so much substantively, but definitely rhetorically. That is to say, um, Jackson said he wanted to preserve an economy based on small farms and small shops, small businesses, uh, and uh, stay away above all from a, an economy and a nation dominated by large corporations. Operations. Well, guess what? We did not get that. Uh, and his uh, measures, he, he 
He adopted virtually no measures to promote those except the veto of the Bank of the United States, which he thought would solve everything and didn't solve very much at all uh, in that department. So um, that, uh, uh, and yet in his rhetoric, uh, Jackson was vehement um, in support of uh, the common man. Um, now, the common white man, as Dan said, and um, uh, he, he certainly delivered nothing for slaves. He was strongly pro-slavery. Um, it was as if the enslaved part of the population was really not part of the United States at all, but another country um, that remained at perpetual war with the real America, uh, which was the white people and uh, had to be kept as prisoners of war uh, to keep them from uh, going wild. Um, so uh, that uh, democracy in that sense works only uh, if, uh, if we consider uh, the enslaved population to be not part of the, the people um, in any uh, serious way. Um, the um, question of whether, uh, and the third question, of course, was whether um, Jackson um, supported the expansion of federal authority. Uh, and uh, that one is a tricky question also, and it doesn't map very easily on our modern understandings of that term. Um, Jackson believed very strongly in the power of both state and federal governments in what he regarded as their proper spheres. So in the proper, in its proper sphere, like tax policy, uh, Jackson insisted that the federal government was all powerful. And once Congress had passed a tax law, that was it. Everybody had to obey it. Uh, and he would use the army uh, to enforce that uh, if absolutely necessary. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, he would say that uh, uh, Georgia had the right to uh, govern its Indian population any way it wished, and that uh, the federal government uh, had no right to interfere with that at all. And so uh, Georgia got a free hand and Jackson supported their policy with his own policy of Indian uh, removal. Um, so um, uh, the, uh, the question of the expansion of federal power um, uh, is ambiguous because uh, you can find examples and counterexamples uh, on either side. And that is why uh, understanding the context uh, of uh, the way that Jackson um, expresses principles is so very important. Um, but uh, in the end, I think that what made Jackson supremely uh, popular in his own day, uh, especially among Democrats, obviously, um, was that he ended up uh, taking the, the rage and the vengeance that he wanted to exact against Indians. And Jason has been very uh, right in proper in pointing out how important that was. But uh, he seems to also have redirected that rage to those whom he regarded as aristocrats. Uh, and uh, those who were interfering with the liberty and the uh, uh, prospects of ordinary uh, white men. Um, and he thought essentially that banks and uh, canal companies and turnpike companies and railroad companies and uh, corporations generally, the infant corporations of his own day, were engines of special privilege uh, that would be uh, used against uh, the interests of the common man. They were the aristocrats of his day and he wanted to crush them. He did not, except in the case of the Bank of the United States. Uh, and yet his rhetorical championing of the prospects of the common white man uh, endeared him uh, to those voters and have made him a, uh, an icon of what the federal government might do to promote the interests of uh, uh, Americans in general uh, in an uh, in in, in a, uh, unquestionably powerful way. Thank you. It's great, Dr. Watson. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all of our participants. Uh, those were uh, 
brilliant, <laughs> very thought provoking, all of you. So thank you very much for that. Uh, please, I, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions here, but uh, for those who are watching this right now, if you would like to ask a question, please do so in the Q&A box. Right now we have three questions in there. And uh, if others would like to join in, we have two from Larry and one from Edith Sullivan. So thank you for doing that. But if anyone else would like to jump in there, uh, I'll try and tackle those uh, or at least get to them for our participants here in just a moment. My, I, I wanna start with Dr. Watson though. I would ask anybody to jump in here and uh, it's sparked by Dr. Watson's uh, last comments there. But I, I would, one of the things that's always struck me about Andrew Jackson, and I haven't done the level of scholarship that you all have. I've taught Jacksonian America for the last 20 years and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, but I've enjoyed it for all kinds of reasons. But one of the things that always strikes me about Andrew Jackson is that he was a true believer in his own rhetoric. Uh, and I think that seems to be rare among at least modern day politicians. And, and I'm curious, Dr. Watson and all of you, Dr. Opal, Dr. Feller, uh, I'm curious how much can we give credence, even if we radically disagree with what Jackson did? Yeah, and which I think we would be really politically incorrect to agree with a lot of what he did. I mean, it would just be strange in this day and age to agree with certain things he did. But regardless, did he actually believe it? Did he believe what he was saying? He strikes me as a relatively honest person, even when he's dueling somebody. I, his duels strike me as just outrageously honest. Oh, yeah. His, his hatred of... Uh of his uh, dueling opponents was as genuine as anything he ever did. Uh, and I don't think, um, uh, or anything he ever felt. And uh, insincerity was uh, an unknown concept uh, to Andrew Jackson personally, unless he was, uh, let's say, negotiating a treaty with an Indian, which he thought was uh, um, a ridiculous exercise in the first place and therefore not worthy of, it, of honesty. But by and large, I would say that yes, he believed what he was saying intensely. Well, that, that's an attractive quality, even I think, even when mm -hmm. there, there are things he's saying that are wrong or that we disagree with. There's just something very attractive about that. And, and Dr. Watson, do you wanna follow up? What, what do you think made this a part of him? Was it, was it Scotch-Irish manhood? Was it being Presbyterian, was it, I mean, what, what kinds of things allowed this? Hmm. Well, it was definitely a personality characteristic, but exactly where it came from um, in the mixture of things that you're talking about uh, is something that I would find very hard to, to parse. Sure. Yeah. Can I add something here? Oh, please. Yeah. I think, I think what Harry said about Jackson's, uh, certitude uh, and, and sincerity is absolutely correct. Whether it's admirable, and, and I, I want to trade carefully here, uh, it was certainly a political asset to him. Uh, as an aspect of his personality, it was an asset, but it was also kind of scary. Uh, Jackson, I think, did believe everything as much as anybody ever did, believed everything he said. Uh, you can find cases of him dissembling, but dissembling was not uh, a, a standard Jackson mode as it was for some other people. Uh, just because he believed what he was saying didn't mean it was true. Uh, and Jackson had an incredible ability to persuade himself of the truthfulness of things that he wanted to believe. Uh, and, and we can find this playing out in a whole bunch of places, for instance, in his messages to Congress, where he described the Indian country as uh, uh, a forest or roamed by wild savages. Uh, and these wild savages included Cherokees who, who had plantations and slaves. Uh, Jackson had an incredible wor ability to see the world as he wanted to see it. Uh, he also, he was entirely sincere in believing his own statements, even when those statements were demonstrably untrue, uh, including his statements about things that had happened in the past. 
Uh, and as a result of that, he got himself involved in a, one controversy over after another with various people about what you did 10 years ago and what I said about it. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. And it's all he said, she said. Uh, and, and Jackson was in every case absolutely certain of the truthfulness, the accuracy of his own memory and the truthfulness of his, of his own statements about it, even when we know that they were demonstrably false. Uh, he never... He never seemed to have any doubt about anything. Uh, and that drew to him people like Van Buren who, to, who were less confident in themselves. It's a great political asset uh, to have no fear, no second guessing, no doubt, uh, no, no hidden you know, hesitation. Uh, it, whether it's admirable as a character trait depends very much on circumstance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. Opel? Uh, I'm so I just to say I really think that he had a pro he took himself profoundly seriously and I think he was an extremely believer in his honesty and in, in most ways as, as as Dan points out I mean he's just not a dissembler by nature. This being said though he did have this way where he would convince himself I, mean, I think he believed that we there's only one way to to handle the the um, unsolvable problem of the, you know, kind of like wild roaming Cherokees that, you know, it's completely inaccurate from the situation in the 1820s where relations with these so-called civilized tribes was stabilizing. And uh, so he, he convinced himself to into things, but once he did so in that sense, he was extremely, uh, you know, brutally honest and, and kind of um, enormously convinced uh, of, of uh, his, his righteousness. I, I find him to be in an un, un, unconventional way quite religious. Um, you know, he's often he's vulgar, and so there's, he would you know, he kind of uh, upset a lot of um, uh, a lot of evangelical Protestants. But his rhetoric and his descriptions of the the travails of his life, especially in 1810s in the warfare, uh, is about the historic books of the Old Testament. You know, he, he's narrating historic books of the Old Testament through the experiences of the uh, army that he was leading into darkness, as he described it. Um, so I think he was a quite religious person as well. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Feller, my, my next question is for you directly, but again, for everybody. And my question uh, for you, especially, and I, I, I love bringing in de Tocqueville on this, uh, so important, and, and I'm in complete agreement, most important writing done on America, especially in the 19th century. But I, I'm curious, and again, this is for everyone, but Dr. Feller uh, first, why is it that we as an American people, and this is a huge question, maybe it's too huge, but why is it that we go from the founding where democracy is really kind of a four letter word? Uh, and, and I mean, we see that in the, the opening of the Constitutional Convention and Madison's notes, uh, everybody's saying we're, we're, not, we're not for democracy, we're trying to stop this. Uh, and of course it has that reputation going all the way back to Plato. What, what changes that allows democracy to become not only something acceptable, but the actual name of a political party? Well, I think the, the last part of that question I can handle pretty simply. Uh, it, it's, it is the name of a political party because by that time, uh, and remember that the Democrats didn't actually take that name till fairly late, mm. uh, 1835. They were still calling themselves Republicans before that. Right. Uh, uh, but by that time, the, wor the word had uh, transformed from a kind of epithet to a uh, uh, to, a, to a banner. So of course there was political advantage. That's part of what I was trying to say earlier. Uh, it, it, by 1835, if you can actually adopt a label and get people to accept it, that you are the democracy, you win. <laughs> uh, you win politically. Why democracy became, uh, grew to become the kind of prevailing ethos, boy, that's a really broad question and I will just throw out some things. Uh, I think we don't we have to think about that a lot. I, I think you could say a lot of it was implicit in uh, the American political founding and in uh, the basic socioeconomic circumstance. I mean, the idea that uh, all men are created equal is embedded there in the Declaration of Independence. And as we all know, that idea, once it's announced, no matter who announces it, it has consequences. Uh, 
it had consequences immediately. And, and, and those consequences, some of them didn't play out politically until the War of 1812 and afterwards. But by the Jackson's, by the time Jackson's elected president, the idea that I get to vote and you don't because I have money and you don't is, has become ideologically indefensible. Uh, the circumstances, and this is something that Tocqueville and others noticed, some of them hated it, some of them loved it, is that compared to the Europe, uh, and in some cases the Britain that they were used to, leaving aside the slaves, leaving aside the Indians, America seemed to be genuinely a classless society. Uh, I mean, Harriet Martineau saying, uh, the pig drivers wear spectacles. <laughs> which to her was a big deal. You know, you're a pig driver in America, you can afford to buy spectacles. Uh, Francis Trollope, another one of those commentators, was absolutely revolted by the fact that the lower classes or what ought to be the lower classes in America didn't act the way lower classes are supposed to act. Uh, and I think, I'm gonna speak very sloppily here, but the broad availability of land, the relative uh, permeability of, of, of economic and class boundaries in America, relative, uh, provided a, a, a fertile field for the idea that, that I'm as good as you are, uh, that you, that, 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 that uh, not only am I as good as you in politics, but that uh, you're no one to tell me what my religious doctrine should be. Sure. Uh, you're no one to tell me uh, what science should be. You're no one to tell me what the law should be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, good. Dr. Opal. Uh, yeah, like I would just say, this? yeah, yeah, I would just say, and then maybe I could even, if I could tie it to one of the questions from, from Mitchell, um, which is a very good question about, you know, the kind of populist tradition. I think it's fair to say that there is both a deep longing in America for a society where there is a very broad, if not entirely equal, broad um, range of prosperity and a lot of kind of um, small property owners. It's like there's like a deep desire for that that I think precedes the revolution, but but goes out of it. And as 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 Dan points out, there's a fertile field. That's actually a really good metaphor for it because of cheap land and high labor, uh, high cost of labor, right? So I mean, I could, you can even quantitative studies really bear out that in the early 19th century for white men, you, you know, you always have to make these qualifiers. They're, they're absolutely necessary. You know, the United States was, was considerably more mobile, much more than, than comparable European societies. Um, that is, does not appear to be the case anymore, but, but in fact at all, but that was the case. And it set this deep, both desire and possibility desire and possibility meet to make a really powerful tradition. And, you know, this speaks to Mitch, Mitchell's question about, is there a common thread? I mean, there's a common thread insofar as there's a real desire, a genuine desire and memory of memory and like living memory of, this, of a society of dominated by small property holders. I, I do see, I think there's a closer line between Jefferson and Brian than Jackson, because I, I think Jefferson is actually more, willing to intervene here and there, um, especially when he's a young politician, to change the nature of how, how, land, how much land costs um, and to even meddle with inheritance laws and things like that. Jefferson was really interested in that. Jackson, I just find less so. Um, and I guess I'll just say as a, as a way to point out there, I do cringe a little bit when, the, when it's often said that, you know, th that Jackson opposed the you know, aristocrats, well, you know, the cotton growers in the lands that he opened, or not just he, but that were open because of Indian removal, those were not poor people. And by the time of the 1830s and 40s, they're enormously powerful people who export their product to Britain um, for a price. I mean, you know, they, they strike me as transatlantic businessmen too. Um, and it's a triumph of Jacksonian rhetoric that they just are somehow not wealthy and powerful, even though they were enormously wealthy and powerful, um, arguably the richest people in the United States. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Dr. Watson? Yeah, um, I'll, let me just throw in a, uh, a couple of uh, points. Um, one of them, um, to, to uh, add to what uh, Professor Opel just said, um, 
It is true that cotton planters were hugely wealthy. It is also true that the huge, the wealthiest ones of them, uh, the, the people in the Delta of Mississippi and the coast of South Carolina, hated Andrew Jackson and, and voted for the opposition. But um, uh, in going beyond that, um, it seems to me that we have to remember that, um, you, first of all, Brad, you're absolutely right that uh, the Constitution was written by people who thought they were opposing democracy and protecting the United States from being destroyed by it. And there's a, an influential line of interpretation of the Constitution that is um, you hear a lot from today, and of course, dates back to Charles Beard and even earlier, uh, that um, supports that view. Uh, those were the guy it's the but the people who wrote the constitution only remained in charge of the united states for 12 years good point <laughs> and, um, they were overthrown by people who called themselves the democratic republicans and so even if the word republican um is a very popular party name for jefferson's party uh the democrats were a popular name for them too. And uh, so uh, ca calling when Jackson says, I'm a Jeffersonian, um, calling his party the, de the democracy is not as radical an invitation in the 1830s as it might be uh, thought of. And the reason, well, the fact that the Jeffersonian Democrats did take control of the country in 1800 or 1801, and um, persuaded people that uh, the Constitution was um, not something to be overthrown in order to reestablish democracy, but that uh, the Constitution could be a vehicle for uh, Jeffersonian principles as well as Hamiltonian principles. And they just kept winning elections on that, uh, on that vision. And so um, I think that in addition to the truth that uh, Dr. Opal and Dr. Feller have uh, expressed, uh, I think that is um, a, a method or a means or a technique by which um, democracy was um, a kind of, uh, what shall I say, civilized or uh, uh, made um, more acceptable in American discourse. Yeah. Good, thank you. All right, my, uh, my last question in terms of each one of you, so this one's for obviously for Dr. Opal, but anyone can answer. I, what were some alternatives? And I, I mean this in the, the broadest sense, what were some alternatives to Indian removal? Yeah, and were so they discussed at the time? Yeah, no, it's a really good point. I mean, the Indian Removal Act, when it comes up, it's a narrow passage, 102 to 97. Um, it's a highly contested uh, um, uh, culmination, as I said. Are, were there alternatives? I mean, from the perspective of the Choctaw and Cherokee and, and Creeks, the alternative was what they were doing, which is essentially <laughs> creating a... No, it's, it's a fair point. They, they sure. were, you know, uh, especially the Cherokee, quite self-consciously, we are making a treaty-worthy country in which we can live... Um, in some degree of semi-autonomy or autonomy from the United States. Um, you know, there are still, of course, examples, of course, of, of sovereign indigenous territories, as known in Canada um, and in upstate New York, the United States and other places where there is, it is still uh, uh, not the territory um, of the United States. Uh, it is rather of, of native land. So there are alternatives based on, uh, you know, large parts of the southern states uh, having in them autonomous, uh, semi-autonomous territories. Is that a, you know, viable going forward? Um, I mean, it's very hard to say. Jackson definitely used that argument to say no one in Maine or Massachusetts would accept it if there was a huge territory in the middle of their settlements. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I think that the, the, the when and how things happen in history is almost as important as whether they happen. And the way and the suddenness from the kind of perspective of the, of the indigenous peoples of the South, the way that that happened and the speed of which it happened after a period of, of much more stability and better relations um, 
I think that really gives a turning point. I think that that's a, that's a real decision that the United States for better and for, for protective Jacksonians for better made to, to um, remake part of the United States. So there's a, a historian Daniel Walker Howe compares and he says, the Whigs have their American system, which is just you know highly uh, difficult, never entirely put in plan to coordinate the economy to compete better with Britain as a capitalist state. Uh, the Jacksonians have Indian removal that, that, and it, it required a great deal um, of federal resources if you include the, the, the um, military force eventually necessary to remove the Seminole. Um, so I think that there were alternatives, um, especially when you think about history potentially happening uh, in a slower time, uh, or even of, um, as Jackson in some ways would propose, what if some Creek or Cherokee men became essentially owners in fee simple, just like their white neighbors? Um, you know, that was not a particularly sincere, I think, uh, offer. In two cases, that does happen, and, and, and those persons do not stay with their land for long. Um, so I think there were alternatives, and it definitely, you know, some historians have gone so far to say recently that Indian removal struck the indigenous peoples of the South like an ambush more than an ine inevitability. Thank you. Yeah. Can I take Dr. a different view on or that? Dr. Filler, please. Uh, th this is going to be perhaps a minority view. Uh, and I, I thought the question was an excellent one uh, because easy, Indian removal is easy to condemn for obvious reasons, and I am not, not condemning it. Sure. Uh, let me disaggregate it a little bit. First, there is the question of were there alternatives to the way the removal was executed? And that's a question that normally we don't consider. And yet there are two things about removal. First is that the Indians were, let's say, just say gypped out of their land. The second is that they were for, put on a forced march where a lot of them died. Uh, one could imagine a removal that was more humanely executed, uh, you know? So one question we could ask just as a hypothetical is would, we, would everybody still be as outraged about Indian removal if nobody in fact died on it? <laughs> if all the promises that were made in those treaties and they were very extensive promises uh, were actually kept uh, and all the Cherokees and the others arrived safe and sound in Oklahoma and got all the things that the federal government promised them and if their land there wasn't taken from them a generation later. Uh, so at least for analytical purposes, we can disaggregate the execution of the removal, which I thought was absolutely a disaster and which Jackson was 100% responsible for and which he paid no attention to from the idea of, you know, is there an alternative to, to them moving? And, and the thing that has struck me, and this is why the whole episode strikes me as genuinely tragic uh, in the Greek sense, uh, not tragic in the way slavery is tragic because you know if they slaves had all been freed then there wouldn't be any slavery if the if removal had not happened okay what does happen and if when I look at the 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 remarks of Jackson's critics his most severe and eloquent and compelling critics uh, they attack the brutality the 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 dishonesty of his policy. They never suggest, at least as white critics, that the solution is for the Cherokees and the, and the Creeks and the Choctaws to remain where they are forever. What they always assume is that the Indians in time, given time, given fair dealing, will come to a realization that they have a whole lot more land than they need and that it would be a good idea if sufficiently uh, compensated to go somewhere else. Uh, I think the number of white people you can find during Jackson's day saying, well, huge swaths of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi ought to remain Indian nation territory into the indefinite future. The number of people, white people I can find saying that is zero. Uh, so I'm not sure where I'm, where I'm going with this, but the other, the other thing is, is that, we have attached Indian removal to Jackson in one way, absolutely correctly. And Jason has talked about this. Jackson came into office, the very first thing he wanted to do was remove the Indians. Uh, and, and it was his first priority. And that's certainly not true of any of his predecessors. 
It's not true that the, his predecessors weren't trying to remove Indians. It's not true that they weren't removing Indians. Uh, and in fact, there have been uh, session and removal treaties for the Cherokees and the Creeks and the Choctaws and the Chickasaws going way back before Jackson. Uh, the United States government had promised the state of Georgia in 1802 that it would get all the Indians out of the state. Uh, now made other promises to the Indians that they could stay there forever. <laughs> and that's part of the problem. Uh, but Indian removal preceded Jackson, nor was it entirely Southern. And in fact, the reason mainly why it focused on the sub Southern Indians is the Northern Indians had already been removed. Uh, by, by the time Jackson becomes president, there are only remnant Indian polit uh, populations left right. in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, and they're being moved out as fast as the government can move them out. So I, I, I am trying to take a wider perspective on it, which in no way excuses uh, the inexcusable things, some of which Jackson did. Thank you. Dr. Watson, you want to weigh yeah. in on this? Um, I have to say a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, as to whether somehow the American nation would work if it had a, uh, a, uh, an, a sovereign Indian component um, in parts of the area that were settled by, um, excuse me, um, uh, that were, were occupied by uh, the native nations. Um, I think it would have. Uh, Jackson always says it would be intolerable to have a native nation inside of a state, but that's where the Navajo nation is right now. And, you know, and uh, that's where uh, so many of the, the Western uh, Indian people are, are on their sovereign territory uh, to this day. Um, so I don't think there's a, a practical reason that would have made it impossible. Um, however, um, I don't imagine that that kind of a settlement could have come about without a much stronger political support from the white population than it had. Um, you know, as a result of all this so-called democracy, we have this majority rule, the whites of the majority, they rule and they're going to rule the Indians out if they can. Um, that uh, is also an ugly, brutal fact that I, I honestly can't see where a political majority in favor of honoring um, Indian possession of those lands was it going to come from? Good. Well, thank you. We are almost out of time. And uh, I, this has gone exceptionally well. Thank you all for your answers on these. I, I do, if we could look really quickly at the Q&A uh, over there, if, if you have a chance to see that. Larry asked a question uh, 17 minutes into our conversation, and we haven't answered it yet. And uh, so I'd like to at least, if, you, if any of you would like to address this, uh, how would Catholics and non-Anglo, non-Northern Europeans fit into Jackson's Democratic Party? Anyone want to take that? Uh, I'll answer it very quickly. Irish Catholics were highly welcome in the Democratic Party, and um, uh, that was that was great. Whereas the Evangelical Protestants who dominated the Whig Party were much more uh, skeptical of uh, Catholic influence in the United States. Thank you. I think that second question from Edith, Edith, unless you disagree, I think we've kind of answered that, uh, looking at where the, what we would do with the American Indians and how we might think about their land. Uh, obviously there's, there's what we would like to be true and what was true. Uh, so thank you for that. Larry again asks, uh, what role did Martin Van Buren have in the creation of the Democratic Party? Let me tackle that. Van Buren is kind of on a roll nowadays. Uh, and, and Van Buren has been credited by many as being the brains uh, behind Andrew Jackson. And I would say that's partly true and partly completely untrue. Uh, I do not think that Van Buren was responsible for Jackson's, uh, for better or worse, magnetic popularity. Uh, that Jackson showed himself to be a very 
uh, magnetically popular politician in 1824 when Martin Van Buren did not did not support him for president. <laughs> so it wasn't like Jackson was going to be, you know, stumbling around without Van Buren to guide him. In terms of policy, Van Buren was very influential uh, in some areas, though, as editor of the Andrew Jackson papers, I've seen this up close. Uh, Van Buren was a very good second banana. Uh, he <laughs> never, never, never uh, succeeded or even tried uh, to convince Andrew Jackson to do something that Jackson wasn't sold on himself. Uh, Jackson was in no sense Van Buren's puppet. Uh, and in some ways, uh, Van Buren was less helpful than Jackson wanted him to be. During the entire nullification crisis, Van Buren was practically uh, hiding under his, under his desk uh, in, in Albany. And, and Jackson was writing him letters saying, why aren't you down here? Why aren't you saying something? Uh, Jackson had certain strengths and, and Van Buren complemented those strengths very well. Uh, Brian Sheehan uh, wants to know, how does Andrew Jackson fit in with the anti-intellectual strain that marks so much of American history? Good. Right in the middle. Yes. Oh, good, good. Yeah, no, you go, please. <laughs> um, I think so. I, I do think it's a little, I mean, Jackson himself, although he's gone down now and, and is, you know, that there's his party definitely took on the role of he's the less educated or the kind of like, you know, um, uh, um, kind of self-taught person. He had expert knowledge. I mean, he, he, the reason he became powerful is because he, he read law with someone and became a lawyer, uh, which is the, the ultimate language of expertise in the early republic, or one of the language expertise in the early republic. But his party has gone down in that way um, in the movement as well. I think that Dan described really well, just the general sense of, of egalitarianism works against expert knowledge, right? It works against the idea that, well, listen to me because I've gone to school. Well, I don't care. I have my own farm. You know, they, they, there's a really powerful way that um, small D Jacksonian democracy works against or has worked against uh, credentialed and expert knowledge. Um, and I think that's for, it's for better and worse. You know, it definitely is a dynamic in American life. Um, if, if I could, I, if it's okay, I just want to just um, make a quick note to uh, Anne Christine, who wrote about the um, the possible mortality rate on the Trail of Tears. Um, I'll just quickly say, uh, Anne Christine, thank you for your question. It's um, it's really important to pose these kinds of questions. I think it's it's critical, as I say. You know, being honest means being particular and specific. So the usual term, the uh, older idea was that around four thousand of the Cherokee, the Trail of Tears just refers to the Cherokee removal, died. There's new research that indicates that it's a lower number than that who perished on the actual deportation. But again, recall that that's something on the order of 1,000 or 2,000 people. But again, remember that's only the Cherokee. Um, one of the worst uh, casualty rates were for the Choctaw who are basically the first to be removed under this policy. And Tocqueville actually mentions this. They are victims um, among other, among other things of the, the first major cholera pandemic uh, in, the, in the world. Um, we're now in the fifth cholera pandemic age, although we don't know here. Um, that disease strikes refugees because it's people desperate enough to drink water that is visibly dirty. Um, so the, the human toll um, just during the actual deportation itself is very complicated um, and, and very high. Thank you. Let's, um, we have a couple more questions about American Indians, but I think we've covered that. Um, and, and if that's okay, I'm going to skip those. Can I throw it? Oh, Can I Dan, throw it please go ahead. Here? I, I don't know how the chat feature works, but things show up on my screen occasionally, people making comments. And one of them was Jackson's father was killed by Indians, which I happened to see. Uh, and no, he wasn't. <laughs> Thank you. I've been mostly focusing on that, the Q&A box. So let's, um, we're, we're out of time. And if you guys don't mind, uh, I'd like to just ask one last question. I like this question quite a bit. Uh, it's from John Wermuth. Is there any value in tracing the history of the Democratic Party from Jackson until the current years? I, I think that's an excellent question. And I would like each of you, uh, if you don't mind, we'll finish with this and any final comments you'd like to have. But I, I'd love to have you address that question. Uh, certainly there's Damn value in it. There's yeah. value in <laughs> tracing anything, to, uh, uh, the, you know, anything that has an origin in the past and, and a consequence today. That, that's kind of what we do as historians. Uh, there were 
maybe there's a huge historiography here that we're not going to get into. Uh, but one could say that as, as late as the late 20th century, there were prominent historians, themselves Democrats, who saw Andrew Jackson as a kind of lodestar of the, the Democratic Party today. Uh, and they did not focus on Indian removal. They did focus on Jackson's war against the Bank of the United States and more broadly his, his uh, war for the purportedly for the common man and the man in the street, the ordinary working man uh, against the aristocrats or as Arthur Schlesinger called them, the business community. Uh, Let's, let's say since that time, and that time was not so long ago, uh, but since that time, there have been some interesting evolutions, which uh, I think if I started to talk about them, I'd probably make a fool out of myself. So. <laughs> well, I think the, if I'm reading the question right, the intent is, would we actually put a, a President Biden or Obama next to a President Jackson? Does it make sense to think of them in continuity? I, I will say one thing on this, Harry and Jason have heard me say it before. You could find that same continuity still surviving. Uh, the one identified by Schlesinger uh, and people mm -hmm. like that. It, it, and that is in the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the anti-corporate, anti-banker mm -hmm. uh, rhetoric of say, Senator Elizabeth Warren, uh, who back in 2014 was giving speeches that were right out of Jackson's bank veto. Now, I don't know that she knew that. <laughs> Uh, and she probably would have been horrified to find it. Uh, I but, think her husband might have given her a seminar. <laughs> given her what? A seminar. First oh, man. First man. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there has been this submerged, perhaps, thread of opposition to the uh, the plutocrats, to, to, to the... Uh, the control of, and with Jackson, it wasn't opposite, as I said, not opposition to wealth, but, uh, and this is where the big planters come in. The big planters may be big and they're rich, but they're not running your life. Uh, and his real objection to the bankers, the Bank of the United States, was these are a bunch of guys who are running the country to suit themselves for their benefit and to your detriment. And I think you can find some of that rhetoric still in the, and policy in the Democratic Party still today. Thanks, Dr. Feller. It's great. Dr. Opal? Uh, no, I, I think that's, that's right. I mean, I, I think that the, the um, there, I, I would think of it as more of a kind of way where FDR to me is the one who kind of, uh, you know, directs the Democratic Party or redirects the Democratic Party towards a more um, robust use and, you know, kind of like immediate use of federal power in a proactive way. Uh, against some of the kind of you know banking corporate interests that um, that Jackson talked about, but but I think that you know for various reasons uh, um, didn't much didn't didn't confront in the same way. Um, but I, I agree. I think that Professor Feller's point is very well taken, which is that there are definitely the, the left side of the Democratic Party or one part of the left side of the Democratic Party, not so much about identity politics, but more about class politics. Uh, about labor, the, you know, the, the Democratic Party used to be the party of labor, and in some extent, in some places, is, is trying to regain that. That, that, that there is a continuity uh, in other forms and other sort of, you know, dimensions of the Democratic Party, which has been much more about kind of a cultural sort of rethinking of the origins of the United States. Then no, you know, then there's the real revulsion to Jackson that Professor Watson talked about. Professor Watson. Yeah. Um... It seems to me that one thread of continuity between Jackson's Democratic Party and uh, Joe Biden's is a commitment to defend the kind of society that would allow small d democracy to flourish. And one of um, one of the things about Jackson, the 19th century Democratic Party was that they were convinced that the way to uh, let that happen was laissez-faire uh, and keep uh, big corporations uh, down, under control, defend states' rights, keep government local, uh, and so on. Um, during uh, the Gilded Age, uh, the first Gilded Age, there was um, a, commit, uh, a dawning belief among many Democrats that that approach to protecting uh, 
uh, small D democracy was not uh, working, that the uh, big corporations were flourishing under that regime and they uh, could only be, um, or the individual could only be protected by a strong government that would restrain uh, those corporations with a regulatory state. And that uh, dominated the Democratic Party thereafter. Um, but the underlying uh, desire um, seems to have been um, somewhat consistent. Another way that the Democratic Party, I think, has been consistent, and this is going to sound strange, but in Jackson's day, uh, the Democrats were the party that defended ethnic diverse, ethnic and religious diversity inside the white community. Um, certainly not across racial lines, but that was, this was the party I've mentioned before, where the Irish were welcome, the, the uh, Catholics were welcome, uh, and um, later on in the 19th century, other ethnic groups as well. Um, and today the Democrats uh, insist that they would like to cross racial lines in celebrating that diversity, but the um, admiration for diversity uh, rhetorically uh, is, is still there. Great, uh, wonderful answers everyone. And I, I thank you for letting us go over a few minutes. So uh, on behalf of the National Association of Scholars, I wanna thank everyone for participating, but especially for you three, uh, just excellent, I think very thought provoking conversation we had. So thank you so much for your time and your goodwill and your thoughts, uh, all, all wonderful. Thanks very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you all. This is a uh, conclusion to the webinar. I will be sending out a follow-up email to all of you speakers and to the attendees with uh, links to the speaker's books and to this video. Thank you all.